It is an extreme honor today to be here with uh, everyone's idol and mentor on Dentaltown.com, uh, Dr. Jay Resnick. I could I could read your resume for 40 days and 40 nights and not cover it, but you are absolutely the oral surgeon of oral surgeons, and there's so much I want to talk to you about. Um, Jay, first of all, you're, I, you're I, making me blush, Howard. Well, you, you are. You're, you're, and, I, and I know Jay. Um, Jay's a, um, a triathlete. He's an Ironman. But most importantly, um, he's he's just a quality guy. I mean, he never lies, cheats, steals. He's humble. He's honest. He's incredibly honest. And the questions that people ask you on Dentaltown, you always take the time to answer the questions. Uh, you're, you're the go-to oral surgeon. Yes. You answer all the oral surgery questions, no matter how infantile the question you treat it with dignity and respect because you know some of these people are in dental school and some are just out and um, i just thank you jay seriously for all that you've done for dental town well thanks howard it's it's just been my honor and, and privilege to be associated with dental town for all these years um, i remember when we first met uh God, a long time ago i think at the second first or second dental town meeting and at the time you know i was sort of the typical oral surgeon um in my practice in a suburban area in Los Angeles and you know thinking that all the general dentists refer all of their wisdom teeth implants etc to the specialist and I didn't realize that there were so many dentists out there in more rural settings in clinics where they didn't have the option of sending to a specialist who really were in desperate need of some guidance and some counseling and some continuing education to make them more comfortable with day-to-day -day oral surgery, basic procedures that they didn't really learn well in dental school. And, you know, I think uh, it was Samir Puri who hooked us up together. And I think it was a match made in heaven for, for uh, both of us in the sense that I was able to bring a lot I think I was the first oral surgeon really posting anything on Dentaltown, and we were able to bring a lot of uh, education, a lot of peace of mind um, to those dentists out there in practice who were struggling with uh, getting through some oral surgery problems and, and procedures. So it's just been uh, it's been wonderful. And Jay, I want to give you some feedback. Um, last month, I was I lectured in four continents in 29 days. Uh, United States, uh, or North America, Europe, Africa, Australia. Um, I remember going on one tour where I was in uh, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Kathmandu, Nepal, and New Delhi. And when I all the same day, all all, all the same trip. <laughs> and, and I and Jay, what's amazing is Dental Town's 180,000 townies, and right at about 15 to 18 percent of them are non-US and yep. I'll never forget walking into the only dental school in Kathmandu and and so many people think that you know America is this one town with one street line there and they they would name these these townies like you as and they thought that you know I have dinner with you every night because we're both from America and we live a block right. apart and um, and I just want to tell you that um um, one thing they're always requesting when I go around the world, and I've been meaning to tell you that, is that, um, you know, in America, we got 250 online C courses, and so much of it is CAD CAM and CBCT and, and all this fancy stuff. And the, and the world has 2 million dentists, and 500,000 of them can listen to it at what we're doing. But a million 500,000 just need so much more basic oral surgery. Right. Attitude yeah. to a partial, a flipper, and you are a legend in so many of these dental schools. I mean, oh, I thanks, yeah, I mean they they call yeah. you they call you by your first name. Yeah. I mean, I was in a dental school in Kathmandu, could barely understand their English. They're saying, "Well, Jay says, yeah, blah blah blah," <laughs> and Jay says, and Jay says because in in Africa, Asia, and South America, extraction yeah. and removable is is. is Cadillac dentistry, yeah. and you are uh, you are not only a legend in the United States, but you are a legend in Africa and Asia and South America, and I've seen it. Um, I want to, and then in saying that, um, so we we need more basic oral surgery. I mean, more. Uh, well, it's 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 on its way, and, and as you uh, may have noticed, about a year ago, I completely revised my online oral surgery website, and uh, I have been absolutely blown away by how many dentists in how many countries around the world have subscribed. I mean, I never would have thought that I would have subscribers in 
China and Japan and Australia and New Zealand and Trinidad and Tobago and I mean you name the country and I've got subscribers there and when I look at the Google Analytics and look at the map of where subscribers are coming from it's just amazing how many dentists around the world um, are you know, you know, we take we take CE for granted here in the United States. There are so many CE courses available to dentists in every city every weekend. Yet, if you know, for the dentists who are practicing in some of these countries, especially the third world countries, they just don't have the CE opportunities uh, in their areas that we do. And that's where you know they they need dental town. They need online oral surgery. They need online education because that's the only way they can keep up with the times. That's the only way they can stay as current as they possibly can in their countries with the resources they have is um, with these online resources. And it's just incredible that, um, you know, you think about when we were in dental school, uh, the internet didn't even exist. And, you know, I'm, I'm a year or two older than you. And, and when I think about that, it doesn't seem that long ago. Um, where we've come uh, with the internet and technology, 3D CAD CAM uh, technology, things we didn't even think of when we were in school, uh, it just changed everything. The way that we do dentistry today and is not even close to uh, what we were practicing when we started dental school. And 25 years from now, you know, who knows? It's going to be, it's going to be. Uh, just mind-boggling. It'll blow us away. You know, it was Gutenberg's press that ended the Dark Ages because for the first time ever, you could write down everything you learned before you died and give it to the next generation or a guy in the next city or in another country. And 500 years after Gutenberg's press, we landed on the moon. And the internet is the printing press at the speed of light, and it is going to yeah. absolutely flatten the um, the learning curve. Mm -hmm. So all two oh, million yeah. dentists are going to grow towards a very rapid mean. I was uh, blown away in Tanzania a couple weeks ago at what some of those dentists were actually doing, mm -hmm. and um, uh, amazing. So yeah. I would I would get to um, I would I would get to um, the hottest topic in oral surgery to this day, and that is um, so we got out of school. It was two dimensional radiographs mm -hmm. uh, and panos, and then came out with a big. 3D CBCT mm. cone beam technology, and then we were all told that we would be able to take a 3D image, and then we would um, email that to Glidewell, and they would make a surgically guided stent, and we would um, be able to just give local, pop in that stent, and drill the hole, and the um, the the implantology would be far more easier, more successful, avoid mental framings and fair of the nerves and sinuses and fantastic. And now the breaking news is that Serona actually owns all the patents for this hmm. and has launched um, lawsuits. Um, Glidewell uh, now no longer offers a surgical guided stent. Oh, really? okay. and, um, and so my first question is, um, my, my first question is, is a general dentist who uh, wants to get into uh, beginner's implantology and pulls number 30 and wants to play still. Is, is, a, is a surgical guided stent something, is, is it overkill? How often does a guy like you use a surgical guided stent? Yeah. I, I would say, well, I, can, I can tell you that I do 99.99% .99 of my implants with guided surgery. And when I tell, especially some of my oral With guided surgery, stents? Guided, with guided surgical stents. Because... You know, you think about, well, first of all, I mean, we're working not on a two-dimensional patient. We're working on a 3D patient. We're providing care. Working makes it sound like we're working on a car. But we're treating patients who exist in 3D. And when we're doing what we do, if we're doing implants, we're relying on a lot of our senses to place the implants in the proper position, angulation, and the proper depth. And I will tell you that no matter how experienced you are, no matter how long you've been doing this, no matter how many cases you've done, no matter how complicated, that when you're in the mouth and you've got that handpiece back there and you're trying to line it up correctly so that it's equally spaced between the tooth in front and the tooth in back, perfectly parallel to them, 
and perfectly positioned mesio distally and buccal lingually. And you've got to drill that drill up and down in a straight line multiple times in a row before you place that implant. I don't care who you are. You can't do that with 100% accuracy at all. You, the best that you can do, and I've talked to, you know, I've been privileged to rub shoulders with some of the biggest names in implantology in the world. And we've sat down over a cocktail. You mean with yourself in the shower? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't sit in my shower, it's too small. Okay. Um, but I, we've sat down over cocktails when people are relaxed and will be honest with you, and there isn't an implant surgeon alive, no matter whether they're a specialist uh, or a general dentist with tons of experience who will tell you that they are any better than about 85% accurate. As far as placing the implant precisely where they plan it to be. It's always, or 15% of the time, it's a little bit off. It's a little too lingual. It's and, angulated a little bit. Um, and that that's with a surgical guide? That's without a surgical guide. Without a surgical guide. Okay. Okay. So without a surgical guide, we're 85, maybe, maybe 90% accurate. Okay. And those are guys that have sunk 10,000 implants. Right. So that means, flip side is, if we're 90% accurate, then 10% of the time we're not accurate. Now, if I'm doing 500 implants a year in my practice, let's say, okay, and 10% of those are a little bit off, that's 50 implants. And hopefully some, most of them are still restorable, but that's 50 implants that are not exactly where I wanted them to be in the span of a year. Now, you know, is that acceptable? Well, you know, we're all, we're, we're all dentists. We're all perfectionists. We like, we like um, our results to be what we intended them to be. And if we're off 10% of the time, and especially if you're a specialist who relies on referrals to send you patients, you know, if all 10% of those errors or all 10% of those inaccuracies are with the same referral, you probably aren't going to see anything else from that dentist again, as far as, as far as implants go. So our goal is to be nine is to be hundred percent accurate. Now, I don't think we can ever get 100%. You know, I learned in, in medical school, there's never an always and there's never a never. Okay? So we want to be as accurate as we can placing implants. So there's no such thing as a simple case. So if you've got a premolar, you've got 29, you've got number 31, and you're trying to put an implant at number 30, you've got one spot, one angle, one position where that implant needs to be. Do you want that to implant placement to be 99.9% .9 accurately placed, or do you want it to be 90% accurately placed? And in my, my book, I want 99.9% .9 accuracy. And so that's why I do every single case with, with guided surgery, with a guided surgical uh, stent. And, you know, I do, have, I do have Galileos in my practice, and I do have Seric in my practice, and I use them together to create my... Uh, uh, planning uh, my, my surgical plans and to generate the surgical guides. So, okay, now for our, for our listeners, uh, Galeos and Serac, those are both owned by Serona. Correct. So like Apple, it's a closed system that's been designed together. Correct. As opposed to an open system where people got all these different parts and pieces and they're trying to get them to network together, mm -hmm. which, in, which in my observation has basically been a disaster. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I... We would like as clinicians for everything to work, just like with our, you know, PCs, we want all the different components to work together no matter who makes them. But I think what's different about computers is your market is huge. When it comes to cone beam, the market is smaller. And these companies have invested millions and millions of dollars into these products and into these technologies uh, for them to work together, for CEREC and Galileo's to work together. And so as much as we would love everything to be shared, um, you know, I think it's going to be a while before they're going to be willing to do that because they've invested an awful lot in the technology and, um, you know, they want their system to be exclusive. I think, I think um, that's perfectly understandable. So eventually all these different systems will probably talk to each other. We'll be able to exchange data back and forth. But at least for right now, 
if you want a truly integrated CAD CAM cone beam system, um, Galileo you know, uh, and, and uh, Sarek from Serona are really your only option. But you know, I've been using them for a long time. I was one of the first Galileo's owners in the U.S. What year was that? Uh, Nineteen? No, wait, two thousand seven, two thousand six. Okay. okay. Um, I was in grammar school at that time. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I helped you across the street, mm-hmm. um, and I did the I did the very first guided or Galileo's guided implant surgery that was ever done, live on stage at the Scottsdale Center. I, don't, I can't remember if you were there or not. Um, so I've been, my history, you know, with, with Serona is, goes way back. In fact, I've done more Galileo's guided surgeries than anyone else in the world. And so yeah. I've, you know, I've, I do a lot of these. I do, you know, probably two or three implant cases uh, in a typical day, and they're all guided. Yeah. Now, now for our listeners, um, Serona used to be the dental division of Siemens, right? Correct, yeah. And then it was spun off. And I, I've been to their headquarters. And, I mean, that, that's a lot of PhDs and white oh, coats yeah. for one yeah. thing. And I've been in a lot of other factories. And you have a programmer trying to program a bridge between this other company's deal and this other company's right. deal. And it's just like if you've ever had software – and you had it dumped into a new program. Like a lot of dentists my age used to have another software, and they uploaded it into uh, EagleSoft or Dentrix or Softden, and you know you lose half your data. That so was tough. So 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 what we've learned so far is that you're recommending the only um, company that uh, makes the 3D radiograph, Galileos, and the uh, CAD CAM. Uh, the Galileos uh, CBCT OmniCam, I suppose. Yeah. So we got that. Um, so let, 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 so for a young person getting into it, um, you know, it's been a horrible economy since Lehman's Day uh, cracked up uh, August uh, 15th, uh, 2008. Um, the only way you can describe this economy is it's, you know, just flat. Yeah, totally. it's, yeah. it's a malaise. There's no boom. There's no, it's just, just flat. So you're talking about two machines. I mean, how much is a Serac machine – cost these days? How much does the Galileo's cost? And is that a justifiable return on investment for everyone listening today? I think if you're brand new into practice, it's a huge investment. I think you're looking at about $150,000, let's say, for a Galileo's and about another 100000 for uh, the CEREC. It's a big investment. It's a, I mean, when you think about the number, it's huge. Um, you, if you're right brand new into practice, I mean, if you got if you got money behind you, that's one thing. But if you're like most of us, um, starting practice from scratch, it's a lot to put out at first. Um, I think you really need to get established a little bit first before you make that investment. Um, okay. Well, my, the first thing my MBA from ASU wants to say is uh, the two hundred fifty thousand dollars you just stated is, is a balance sheet number. Right, well, I'm, I'm not and, done, and, Howard. I'm not done. Right, but, <laughs> but, but but what would but what would the cost be on a statement of cash flow? Okay. What what would the what would the monthly well, payment? What I was going to get to, and I'll give you my example of when I first bought Galileo's. Okay, um, Galileo's at the time was about one hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. I did get a little bit of a discount, um, but it ended up costing me about. Thirty-five hundred dollars a month on the on a lease, five-year lease to own. So I said, okay, if I can do a dozen scans at three hundred bucks a piece for the next, you know, five years, that's going to pay for the machine. That's going to cover my lease, and anything above that is gravy. If and you did what, what? If you did how many scans? I, I, I figured if I do twelve, let's see, twelve at, at three hundred dollars a piece is thirty-six hundred dollars, right? 12 at 300. 12 at 300 is 3,600. 3, okay. And your lease payment was 3,500. 3, so if okay, I do. So we're positive on a statement of cash flow. So if I do a dozen scans a month, I'm at least breaking even on it. Well, what I found was that as I got the technology into the practice, I used it more and more. And now I actually probably get about 50, 60, or sometimes even 70 scans a month um, because I'm doing implants. I'm doing impacted wisdom teeth, looking at the nerve relationship with the with the impacted uh, or the roots of the teeth. I'm looking at sinuses. I am having patients come in with trauma, patients coming in with pathology, with impacted canines, with perioendo lesions, with pain that's unclear where it's coming from. Um, you know, my 12 cases that I had to generate to pay for the technology was the tip of the iceberg. So the 
the, the long answer to your question is you've got to think about how you're going to use this technology in your office and don't think of it as a $150,000, $250,000 investment, but as you said, the MBA way of looking at it is look at your monthly cash flow, your output of what it's going to cost you per month, and can you generate that much dentistry per month from uh, from having the technology in your office? And what I've uh, learned talking to a number of uh, general dentists who have the technology is not only do they use the technology for, you know, as it was, as you think of it was intended, like for uh, implants for, for Galileos and uh, crowns for uh, and inlays for CEREC, but the amount of dentistry, for example, uh, that it, may, it finds you to do. So endo lesions that were occult, you're now discovering them on routine exam and treating them before they become symptomatic. Uh, you are having patients come to your office, see the technology, being blown away by how high tech your office is, and referring friends. Okay, so what is the uh, – now, you're a DDS and an MD. Yes. So are you billing these out medical or are you billing these out dental? Does dental insurance pay for these? It depends what we're doing it for. Now, there are some there are some services out there that, that will bill um, pretty much every scan under medical. Okay. There are uh, services for dentistry? Service, that, there are services for dentists that – um, that will assist you in learning the billing codes and the techniques for billing cone beam at, uh, under the patient's medical insurance. And what is that company? You got a www? For uh, I'll have to, uh, let's see, um, I'll have to give you the information. I don't have it off the top of my head. But uh, I, I'll be the only guy who ever <laughs> lived that knew something that Ask the question that Jay didn't have the answer. <laughs> uh, I can find it real quickly, but uh, uh, I'll get it to you. But there are there's a few there's a few people that do this. The one guy that I know is his name is Hutan, and you can, I know you can reach him through uh, Patterson. Everybody with Patterson knows Hutan. Um, so uh, actually, on my podcast, we have a transcript of all these notes. So we'll just have oh, all great. these in the notes. Okay. Yeah, I I do that so the dentist can multitask and do laundry and wash dishes Perfect. and do lab work. And not have to stop and write down now. Perfect. So all this will be in the transcript. Right. So what I do for my practice is if it's a dental indication, so it's for wisdom teeth, it's for impacted canines, anything like that, we generally either bill it under the patient's dental insurance as a panoramic plus a CEF, because that's really what it is, uh, except that it's 3D when you put them together. Um, or if it's for TMJ, if it's for pathology, if it's for sleep apnea, then we do bill it under the patient's medical insurance as a 3D scan. Now, the difference between billing under dental insurance and with medical insurance is medical insurance always requires a dictated report, a written report of the indications for the scan and what the findings were. So that's one difference so, that you, what's one thing you need to know if you're billing for cone beam under, under medical insurance. Okay, so, pan, so you bill out a pano and stuff if it's wisdom teeth. But for uh, medical, you said sleep apnea and what else? Sleep apnea, TMJ, trauma, pathology. Okay. No. And, and I, I was amazed that you said TMJ because on Dental Town, if you call it TMJ, some people throw you under a bus. That mm -hmm. it's got to be TMD. But you think TMJ is still the accepted term? Well, you know, I, do you I don't go on those forums. But, I, you know, I think um, – TM, well, TMD includes, in my mind, TMJ. TMJ is nothing more than temporomandibular joint. So when patients tell me, oh, I have TMJ, I say, oh, that's just like saying I have knee or elbow or shoulder. Okay? Um, what they have is TMJ dysfunction or myofascial pain or, or temporomandibular dysfunction. But when I speak about TMJ, I'm speaking about bony or, or joint pathology. Um, which is what you're going to image with cone beam. You're going to see if there's arthritic changes in the joint, decreases in joint space, changes in, in uh, uh, joint position, changes in condylar uh, morphology. So when I'm, when I'm saying TMJ, I'm really specifically saying what bony changes you'll see on the CT scan. And I don't want to get into a big TMJ discussion, but but um, I don't what either. Of, what 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 percent of temporomandibular joint disorder pain is um? Do you think is psychosomatic from the brain stress versus uh, actually something um, wrong? Well, I, th I think uh, I mean you've got your patients that have organic joint disease, like patients with arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, and that type of disease. 
Um, that's probably a small percentage, maybe 10%. The rest of patients, most of the symptoms they have, whether they're TMJ being joint symptoms versus TMD, more uh, joint and or muscle, uh, has to do with stress and clenching, bruxism, uh, putting an extra excess load on the joints that they're not accustomed to uh, handling and resulting in joint pain result, resulting in muscular pain. And I'll, I'll tell patients that, you know, what causes this, because uh, they say, well, I'm only, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I only grind my teeth maybe for 10 minutes a night. You know, they don't really know, but I'll tell them that you don't really know how much you're grinding at night. And even if it is only 10 minutes, it's putting a lot of stress on that joint and on that system. And so just as if you've got, you know, you walk, you have someone walking around with a backpack with 50 pounds of rocks on their back, okay? For a long time, they may not have any issues, but over time, they're going to start developing back pain, knee pain, hip pain. It's the same thing with TMD or TMJ, that it ta everyone has their own threshold of what's going to make them symptomatic. And some patients, it just takes a little bit of uh, insult, and they're going to have symptoms. Some patients, it takes a lot. But um, uh, I would say probably, you know, to answer your question again, probably 90% of the patients uh, out there uh, can attribute some or most of their symptoms to, uh, to stress or the results of stress, like uh, bruxism. Okay, so let's get – so – We've talked about the fact that you do 99.99% surgical guided. We've talked about that you really like the closed integrated system under one Serona umbrella, mm -hmm. the CAD CAM and the uh, the Galeos, uh, and and you're milling it. Are you milling out your own surgical guided stents? Uh, occasionally, um, I do have I have done a number of uh, the Seric guides. Um, most of the time, when my patients come in, um, they've had the tooth missing for. You know, for a little while, we maybe took the tooth out a little while ago, or they've been edentulous in the site for a while. Uh, for those cases, you know, I don't need to mill out a guide and have it ready this afternoon. Um, I have the luxury of being able to send it off to Germany and getting it back next week. For so you're so you're emailing your CBCT file, correct? And uh, and a lot of a lot of dentists believe that the file's too big mm -hmm. to uh, um, to email. So are you doing this to a Dropbox it's, or yeah, how are exactly. you? Exactly, it's an it's an upload through uh, CCAT. It goes to their Dropbox, um, and uh, they have a, the system. Actually, the whole technique or the whole sequence is integrated into the implant uh, planning software, so that it allows you to automatically upload the data as the final step in the process. And, it, you know, you just basically click a couple buttons, you let it go, go have some coffee, come back, see a couple patients, and it's done. Uh, so, it's And this is going to – so you're going to give me the names of uh, a later email that I'll put the transcript of all the people that can bill out CBCT to medical. <laughs> and then you can give me the uh, the names of this uh, – this, uh, place you're sending it to it, you said it's in Germany this is, well, I this is, it, yeah, this is, this is CCAT S-I-C-A-T which is the uh, a company that's owned by Serona that developed the implant planning software and who makes the surgical guides okay and so you email that to them and how long does it take you to get the surgical guide and uh, where, where in California are you I'm in, Tazza, I'm in Tazza, Tarzana which is uh, Tarzana. suburb of Los Angeles uh, okay you're in Tarzana, Tarzana. I just went to Taz I just went to Tanzania. No, where did uh, I go? Tanzania. Tanzania. Okay, we're not even close. Tanzania, and you're in Tarzania? Tarzana. Just think of Tarzan with an A on the end. In fact, okay, Tarzana. The, the reason it's called Tarzana is in the, in the hills, about a half a mile up the street from my office, is where they filmed the original Tarzan movie. Seriously? Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, that is... That is uh, yeah. and 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 Samir's from Chatsworth. Uh, Samir lives in Chatsworth. He actually used to practice in my building until he uh, moved to Phoenix, Wisconsin. Yeah. So so you're gonna mail that to uh, Germany, Serona, uh, and then when are you gonna get it back in uh, Tanzania, Africa, LA? <laughs> well, I, I, I send it out, and generally um, I will get it back if I upload it. I can get it usually get it back uh, five working days later. Okay, and what is that going to cost you? Uh, it's, uh, I think, 30 Well, the, the surgical guide itself is about $300. Uh, if I'm doing multiple sites, it may be 350 or 400 uh, And then I think about 30 to, 30 bucks shipping. 30 bucks yeah. shipping? Okay, and... Uh, and it comes back. Okay, okay and so 
here you are, um, and, and again, when we're talking, you know, not only are these podcasts downloaded all over the world, it's a, you know, two million downloads around the world. The United States is also a huge, vast country. Yeah. You just, people oversimplify the United States. It's funny how when you go around the world, they all think of New York as New York yeah. City as America. And the United States is the same size as China. And half of them are spread out in 107, half the dentists are in 117 uh, cities, and the other half are in 19,000 cities. And like you say, if you can't do oral surgery or you can't do basic stuff in these towns of 5,000, um, um, you, you can't really pr you can't um, practice, raise the oral yeah. health. You can't practice and you can't raise the oral health of your community. Uh -huh. I mean, we all got to be public health dentists. So, so I'm a dentist. I'm, uh, I want to get into this. I got to do, uh, I got to do uh, um, 10 to 12 uh, scans a month to make this uh, cash flow for the Galileos. Um, what, what, tell, walk through what, a, what a, a, a newbie, a beginner could do. I mean, could he replace the, the most common missing tooth in America is going to be a first molar. Uh, we're, we, we we're told there's four different implant sites. There's, there's the, um, the anterior there's maxilla, there. which is styrofoam. The posterior maxilla is all sinuses. Uh, the the posterior mandible's got that big inferior alveolar nerve, a metal foramen, and a and a and a and a loop coming out of there. And then you got the uh, the Large, the easy yeah. section, the lower anterior, which is hard as oak wood. You have no sinuses yeah, or nerves. Any what, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So so walk through the beginner. What 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 could you expect to do? What, how would you um, w wade into the placing your first implant? Because what percent of the general dentists would you say have never placed? Their first implant. I would say it's probably something like eighty percent of dentists have never placed an implant. Um, See, I would have said I would have said ninety. Okay. It could but be. My could friends, be. and you know, my more friends than aren't as smart as yours. <laughs> my friends aren't as smart as yours. I was being conservative, but okay. So, so, so four, so eighty to ninety percent of everybody listening to you is a virgin. They've never done one. So tell, talk to me like I was your uh, your only son who just graduated from dental school. How would I wade into this process? Well, I would start off with simpler cases. And what I mean is in a non-aesthetic area where you've got lots of bone, um, you've got uh, uh, a little bit of room, for, a little bit of wiggle room for placing the implant. So if it's a little bit off angle, a little bit off position, you're still going to be okay. Uh, in a healthy patient with lots of keratinized tissue um, and uh, uh, you know, no, uh, thing, you know, not a, not a non-smoker, uh, someone who's in good health. Okay, start off with the simple, easy, non-aesthetic, non-smoker. What were the what were uh, the other ones? No significant medical problems, so not a diabetic. Um, you know, just basically a healthy patient, young healthy patient. Okay. Young healthy patient, not where I'm going to see right. it. Exactly. Okay, now good now now we're so, healing. So uh, it's not gonna not gonna give you any trouble when it comes to healing. So uh, a healthy young non smoker. What, you, what are we talking? Second buy back or first buy back? Uh, second buy, first molar, first buy are, are good places to place implants. Okay, let, let's start. Let's start with the uh, with the most common missing tooth in America, a okay. first molar. That's, so that's, so that's, now, a, I'm, that's I'm, a great one. But, but, but okay, what I want to tell but, you is that you know that you have to keep in mind that as simple as people like to make this sound, you're still doing surgery. You're still cutting through tissue on somebody. You're still drilling into bone. Okay? So don't take that lightly. You learn in surgical residency that you have a big responsibility. It's a big, big privilege to be able to operate on somebody. Okay? So you know, in dental school, we sometimes we tend to not really make light of some of the procedures, but we we kind of think that they're simple and you know they're not invasive. You know, a class class one amalgam, um, you know, it's got a few complications. If you get you know if you hit uh, if you pulp out, you can get a root canal done. Uh, it's it's not as invasive, um, more reversible. Surgery, for the most part, is not reversible. If you don't do good surgery, okay, then it's very hard to redeem yourself from that. So what I tell newbie dentists who are newbie implantologists is that you need to learn implantology 
to the standard of someone who has been fully trained in implants. The same standard as a periodontist, as an oral surgeon, so that you understand what you're doing. You understand the principles of bone healing, of soft tissue healing, um, soft tissue management, bone management, so that you are prepared to deal with the things that will come up in surgery. Because there's not, you know, there's not a surgeon alive who has never had a complication. Okay? Complications are part of doing any surgical procedure, and what separates the men from the boys, so to speak, is, is knowing how to anticipate those complications, how to avoid those complications, and how to manage them if they do occur. Okay? And that's where a lot of people get themselves in trouble, is they see that empty edentulous space, and they see the drill in their hand, and they see the titanium implant, and they just, without thinking about what they're doing, go to place the implant, and something happens. Okay? And they're not prepared to manage, to avoid the complication, to recognize it, or to, um, or to, to treat it. And so that's where, uh, you know, you can really get yourself in trouble. So take, if you're going okay. to be placing implants, if you're going to be doing any surgery, we talk about any surgery, whether, you know, uh, and we talk about this a lot in the oral surgery courses that I teach, is know what you're doing, think about it like a surgeon, be prepared for um, what may happen. Know how to manage the common complications so that you can, you know, it, it, you're self-assured you are providing the best care for the patient. Because what it comes down to is really doing what's best for the patient. I just realized you, you got to write a series for Dental Town, uh, um, Losing Your Implant vir Virginity. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I ask you right now um, – Go through the, the top complications you're seeing newbies getting into that they were over their head. They with, did that with implants or in general? With him, implants. Uh, I, or, or in general. Well, or in general. Uh, one of the big things that I'm seeing is not properly evaluating the surgical site and placing an implant where it shouldn't have been placed. And a good example is the case that I just did right before I came to came here is. Um, a uh, patient was missing a lateral incisor um, and congenitally missing a lateral incisor. Uh, the dentist uh, took a panoramic radiograph, did a clinical exam. Um, there was fibrous tissue uh, in the area of the, of the ridge because, you know, the patient had, be, had been congenitally missing tooth number seven. And so the ridge resorbed over time, okay? It was hard to appreciate that clinically because there was some fibrous tissue in there. And so the ridge felt like it was adequately wide. The dentist placed the implant uh, using a flapless technique because there was adequate keratinized tissue. And the implant went into the bone. And two weeks later, the implant was loose. Now we go back and we do a 3D CT scan. And we see that the implant was half in bone, half out because of resorption of the ridge. Okay. So the mistake here was, was not recognizing that in a patient who's got a congenitally missing tooth that you're going to have ridge resorption nine times out of ten. And anticipating that, evaluating for that with a 3D scan and then managing it appropriately either by grafting or referring to a specialist who can graft and prepare the ridge uh, for the implant placement. So that's one thing we're seeing is not adequately working up the case. The other is... The so that person, that th this wouldn't have happened if they would have had a CBCT and they would have got a surgical guidance They, they would have seen that the ridge was narrow and they would have, they would have augmented the ridge first and not even <laughs> attempted to place the implant right away. Now, now, would the um, now when you send these CBCTs, they're also diagnosing and telling you the width and length of the implant. Correct. correct? So you're seeing on screen uh, in 3D and various cross sections the height and the width of the bone and the density, and then you have the opportunity using implant planning software within uh, within the uh, the scan to bring in a 3D image, an STL file, stereolithographic file. 
of the implant that you want to place, no matter which or whatever system it may be, in the various diameters, various lengths, and you actually place that virtually into the patient's jaw. So you can see, do you have enough width of ridge? Do you have enough uh, height of bone uh, before it goes into the sinus or above the nerve or the, the nasal cavity to be able to place the implant? Um, in you know the old days, if I was placing, let's say, a fir lower first molar implant at tooth number 30, I would have a five millimeter diameter implant that my guesstimate was that I was going to need a 10 millimeter long fixture. I would also have an eight and a half, and I'd also have a 12, and I'd also have a six, and I'd also have a four diameter, because I knew that sometimes I would flap it open and the bone wouldn't be as wide as it looked on the panoramic, or I would start drilling and realize that you know, I need a shorter implant, or I can go with a longer implant. And with cone, oh, I and know. With cone beam technology it's... and 3D, 3D scanning and treatment planning, I don't need to do that anymore. I know exactly what implant I'm going to place, and, um, and then I plan the exact angle that it needs to be placed, the exact position and depth, so that it's coming out exactly with the central axis of the restoration, and using my surgical guide that was created from the CT data, I now have a guide that allows me to place that implant with high degree of accuracy, with a 1% variation in angle and about a 500 micron maximal variation in positioning. Yeah, and some of these young kids showing off their implant cases on Dental Town, sometimes I've just wanted to log on and say, do you realize 27 years ago when I went to the mission student, got my fellowship at the mission student, and uh, my diplomat at the International College of Implantology, that we didn't have yeah. any of this fancy stuff. And you had panos, and until you flapped it open, you never knew what you had. So this guy going into a first molar, what percent of the time could he place a stand and not lay a flap? Well, you know, I get this question asked all the time when I'm, when I'm lecturing and I get emails from dentists. Uh, they say, well, I have a surgical guide. Does that mean I... I don't need to flap it open. I can do a, a flapless technique or a punch. And that, you know, that in a sense shows me uh, what I was talking about is not having that fundamental understanding, not having that fundamental knowledge of basic implantology. Because what determines whether or not you need to lay a flap versus being able to do a punch technique is not having a surgical guide. It's the amount of keratinized tissue that's present on the ridge and whether or not you need to do any bony augmentation or, or bony contouring. That's what determines it. Okay. So in your practice, doing, you're doing 500 implants a year. What percent of the time do you lay a flap or not have to lay a flap for a simple one implant root form replacing a molar? I first probably molar. do those flapless 90% of the time. But, but also wow. keep in mind that I'm developing that site um, using uh, ridge preservation technique and, and keratinized tissue regeneration from the time that I took that tooth out three to four months prior. So I'm okay, and, and then for the other dentist who's thinking about, again, losing his dental, should we name this this podcast, Losing <laughs> Your Virginity? Sure. virginity? Um, so what scare, what would be higher risk? A lower first molar with that inferior alveolar nerve, you hit that, that's not good. Or a maxillary first molar and hitting a sinus. What What is the bigger, the well, bigger risk? The, well, let's, let's talk about the difference between the those chance, two, mandible the and maxillary. The chances of impacting the sinus on a maxillary first molar are much greater than the chances of, of impacting the nerve. Um, so if you're doing, let's say you're, you don't have cone beam. Um, you're just using a panoramic only, okay? you can get a pretty good estimate of where that inferior alveolar nerve is. And for most of the time, you're going to be safe with a 10 millimeter or 10 to 12 millimeter implant. Okay? If you have to, you can go a little bit shorter, like a 9 or maybe an 8. I wouldn't go any shorter than that. Um, but you can get, let's say, an, on average, a 10 millimeter implant in that site without a problem. Okay? In the maxilla, if, especially if the tooth has been gone for uh, as little as four months, 
you can get pneumatization of the sinus where the sinus now starts to dip down, and you may only have, even if you did rich preservation grafting, you may only have about six millimeters of bone left. Okay? So that ridge shrinks because it's expanding from the, from the sinus side. And so um, you know, I'm finding that even when I do really careful ridge preservation technique, on a first molar site and I build up the ridge and overbuild it, I'm still having to go back probably 30% of the time and doing an indirect sinus lift at the time I place those upper first molar implants. And so if you're going to be doing those, then you also need to know the technique for doing an indirect sinus lift. So again, you know, so to answer, in answer to your question, I think the lower first molar is a safer bet of a first case to work on uh, or a first case to, to tackle than an upper first molar for that reason. And and so how would a dentist learn this science? Well, there just happens to be a lot of a lot of courses out there. There's a lot of uh, there, and they range from weekend courses uh, given all over the country, uh, or even you know uh, abroad in, in resorts to uh, <coughs> fellowships where you go one weekend a month. And, you know, for, for two years to really learn uh, everything you possibly can about uh, implantology. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. I mean, uh, uh, Arun Garg gives some great courses. Um, you know, Mish Institute is a, you know, if you want to get really involved in implants, it's fantastic. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity out there for education. There's a, a number, there are a number of uh, implant institutes in California. Uh, by various clinicians that are available. There's, all you have to do is get on the internet and Google uh, dental implant, you know, live surgical training, um, hands-on training, and there's, there's a lot out there. Okay, I want to completely switch gears because I know of the 2 million dentists on Earth, uh, you know, 80, mm -hmm. 90, pr uh, uh, of, on Earth, probably 95% of dentists yeah. have never yeah. placed an implant. But, but the, the next... Uh, hardest thing would be okay. a wisdom tooth so I got I got you for 13 Good. minutes left um, what tell tell Dennis your thoughts on what you think uh, the problems are with a general dentist when they're pulling out a wisdom yeah. tooth and what, what what do you see them doing wrong and what advice would well you give them? I think um, you know going back to what I said earlier about uh, the implants uh, it's the same thing and that's not evaluating the clinical situation in the eyes of a surgeon. Okay? Uh, and what I mean by that, and, I, and when I give my courses, I talk about this right up front. And say, you know, there is a big difference in my training versus yours, okay? that we will never equalize. Okay? Um, but what we can equalize is our thought process. Okay? When a general dentist is doing a crown prep, they visualize what that prep is going to look like when they're done. And so they know what burrs they're going to need. They know what hand instruments they're going to need. They know everything they're going to need to complete that crown prep efficiently. They know what they're going to do if they get a pulp exposure. They know, you know, for example, if you know, they need, if there's too much uh, carious uh, tooth tissue and they need to build up, uh, they need to do a post and a build up. They've got all this in their back of their mind before they pick up the handpiece. Yet when they take out a tooth, they go in there with a the forcep and they wiggle it and when it breaks, they get in there and start digging and are become frustrated after a half hour of not doing anything. So the one of the biggest pitfalls that dentists get into um, with doing surgical extractions or impactions is not mentally walking through what they're going to be doing and having the right instruments available to them and knowing what to do to do that efficiently. Okay? Um, when I do my typical case of four partial or full bony impacted wisdom teeth, Okay. And granted, my patients are under general anesthesia, so I can work a little bit faster, but my typical case is 12 to 16 minutes for all four wisdom teeth. Okay. And I don't do it in 12 to 16 minutes for four wisdom teeth because my hands are moving this fast. I do it because I'm efficient. Okay. I'm efficient with my movements and because my staff 
has been with me for a long time and I have them trained and they know they can anticipate what instrument, instrument I'm going to need next and they have it ready in my hand. Okay? And that comes with doing the same thing over and over again the same way. Okay? But again, we have that plan. We know what we're going to do. So, you know, I would say if you're going to do impactions, if you're going to do surgical extractions, okay, anything beyond a tooth that's flapping in the breeze, get yourself some education in not only the technical aspects of oral surgery, but also the thought processes of oral surgery so you can start thinking more like an oral surgeon because it will really help you. It's what keeps you out of trouble and gets you out of trouble. What I see most commonly, usually the, uh, when a dentist gets into trouble taking out a wisdom tooth, is they didn't make an adequate enough flap to, to get access and see what they're doing. They didn't remove enough bone for the tooth to come out or for, to get the roots out. They didn't section the tooth properly. Or just flat out, they didn't have the right instruments. And, and you know, they, there's what, no way they could complete the case because they didn't have the right instruments. If all I had was a straight elevator and a 62 forceps, I couldn't do what I do the way I do it. You've got to have <coughs> the right, you've got to have the right instruments also. And to our viewers, uh, I've been in your office, and it's like watching a Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart play the piano, or would you say you're more of a Chopin in uh, <laughs> Warsaw? But um, but I but I want to back you up a little further. Um, you and I have a very good friend mm -hmm. that we love, hold and mm -hmm. dear, truly, who removed a canine mm -hmm. on a person, and the infection uh, went back into the head, and mm -hmm. they died in the hospital three days later of a brain abscess. Um, we've um, and he didn't yeah. put him on antibiotics afterwards. We, we also. Um, how often do you hear of a Ludwig's angina case? So I, I want you to go through, because a lot of dentists um, are asking on Dental Town, you know, can you pull a hot tooth or do you mm -hmm. got to put them on antibiotics and let that settle down? Go over the okay. worst case okay. scenarios. And, and what, what, do you call, what, what do you call canine to canine? Because mm -hmm. there's no valves right. on the veins going right. back into the head. So, so let's, I've only okay. got you for eight more minutes. So let's go over. The worst case scenario, which is someone dies from okay. pulling a tooth. You just, well, you just for, I mean, first of all, it's pretty rare to actually kill someone from pulling a tooth. Um, usually, if the patient dies a few days after you take out the tooth, it wasn't because you took out the tooth. It was because the patient had that infection there for weeks, and the infection made its way to the blood system and into the brain and you just happen to take out the tooth three days before it killed him. Okay. Um, so you're talking about Ludwig's angina okay, so and maxillary like brain abscess. abscess. So that, that brain abscess was probably well on its way to occurring before the tooth was taken out. So you think that person would have died whether or not they had the tooth removed probably, or not? Probably, yeah, yeah. Now, it's possible that okay. by going in and manipulating the tooth, it may have pushed some bacteria through those, you know, valveless veins, uh, towards the cavernous sinus, you know, that towards the center, center of the brain. But, uh, you know, it's hard. You know, it's hard to know for sure. But most likely, if something like that happens in a scenario like that, it's because that infection was long-standing, and it was going to go to the brain soon anyway. Now, and are those the two main things: incisors back into the brain well, and levels well, and dynamic second molars? I've been doing this for now for what, almost 25 years, and I have yet to see. I think, I think I've seen one case of a dental infection uh, from the anterior that actually went to the brain uh, that you could associate with uh, with an abscess tooth. Uh, it's it's very rare. Okay. Uh, most of the time, the patient's going to have external swelling and pain, and they're going to seek care before it ever gets to that. Um, now, but going back to, you know, thought, okay, what about lung angina is a little different because you can have a, um, a lower molar, which is usually the cause, uh, that has an abscess. And that at, the patient will have tooth pain. But what will happen is the reason they're having pain is that the swelling, the edema, is within the periodontal ligament space, pressing on the nerves in the PDL, 
and that's what's causing the pain. Okay? Eventually, that infectious process will erode through the bone via the path of least resistance. And a lot of times, that gets to the lingual aspect of the mandible, and when it does, releases some pressure, and the patient will have some pain relief. But unfortunately, then the infection will start to spread uh, into the fascial spaces of the neck. Again, it's, it's not a common occurrence. When I was in residency at LA County Hospital, we saw it a lot. Um, but you know, in private practice, we don't see it all that often, maybe only once, once or twice a year. Um, but 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 what's your, but what's what's the short simple rules for a general dentist and a and an office okay. and it's a hot well, here, number here's two? What I, uh, do I do I antibiotics first or okay. pull it and antibiotics or give them a gram pre op? Well, here, here's how I look at it. Um, there are two different types of dental infections. There is a true there's dental periapical pathology, and there is pericoronitis, which is inflammation or infection in the soft tissue around a wisdom tooth. With pericoronitis, the infection is in the soft tissue, not in the tooth. And if you go in and take out the tooth in the face of that, you definitely will push bacteria, you'll push the infection into the fascial space. So you want to make sure absolutely that the patient is on antibiotics before you touch them, and you calm that down before you go in there and do surgery. With peri is a gram is a gram now and pull it an hour later enough? Or are you talking about With 24 Perry hours, 40 I usually hours, give three 24 days? hours. I put them also on chlorhexidine rinse and warm salt water rinses every one to two hours to bring the swelling down. Okay, for periapical infection, uh, it's a little it's 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 different, but there's a lot of room for for clinical uh, experience and clinical judgment. An abscess tooth is like a splinter in your finger. Okay? That infection is not going to get better until you take the splinter out. Okay? So a dental, a dental abscess of a tooth is not going to get better until you take out the source of the infection, which is either by extracting the tooth or doing endodontic treatment. Okay? So that's the primary thing that you've got to do. Is you've got to get that tooth out ASAP because that's the source of the infection. <laughs> now, is that you know always a practical thing to do? Well, if the patient's got got a, a little bit of swelling, I don't think you necessarily need to. Well, if, if the infection has gotten into the tissues, then I definitely will pre-med them. Let's say a gram of of uh, cephalexin or two grams of amoxicillin, something along those lines, about 30 minutes before I take the tooth out. Okay. Um, because you want to get an adequate blood level of antibiotics before you uh, take the tooth out. One gram, you said one gram of yeah. cephalexin, keflex, or, or grams two of grams of amoxicillin. And what, and what do you, what do you think of the guy still using? You know, it MBK? works. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, it's a, it's an old drug. It's been around forever, and it's still fairly effective for dental pathology. Um, now, if the patient comes in and they're really swollen, okay? Um, again, I'll do the same thing. I'll get them on, you know, I'll give them a loading dose of antibiotics, but the key is to get that tooth ASAP, okay? If someone comes in and they've got a lower molar that's abscessed and they've got a little bit of swelling, okay? I know from experience that trying to numb up that lower first molar, especially if it's been root canal, and get that tooth out and the patient to like me afterwards is pre going to be pretty difficult. Lower molars, lower second molars, first molars that are infected are really hard to get numb. So I will put that patient on antibiotics, chlorhexidine rinse, saline rinses, load them up on antibiotics, let that infection cool down a little bit, and then bring them back to the office in one to two days to take out the tooth. Okay, and I only got you for one minute. And in one minute, when you when you travel, when you lecture from Poland, all these different countries, some pe some people think you got to use hydrogen peroxide because it's going to oxidize the anaerobes. Some like say um, salt war, war, war. Some like um, chlorhexidine gluconate. What is the difference? Yeah, what, so you you keep saying chlorhexidine gluconate yeah. and salt water rinses. What what is the killing mechanism of a salt water rinse? Are you are you thinking the warm water disassociates sodium from chlorine? No, basically, and basically what the a salt water rinse? does is is the it agitates 
um, if you've got, let's say with pericoronitis, the warm salt water um, will agitate the site just physically, but the warmth that causes vasodilation and causes uh, more blood flow to the area, which will help the antibiotics get into the tissues and bring down the swelling. The other thing that it does, and then so the, the salt, salt, the salt, sodium and then chloride the salt acts okay. is hypertonic. So compared to the cell, so when you're rinsing with the salt, what it does is it draws, uh, because of fluid shifts, draws the edema out of the tissues and reduces the swelling. So you've got the physical action of just the rinsing, the warmth of the rinse that increases uh, blood flow a little bit, and you've got the osmotic action of the salt, which reduces the edema. And I just want to end on this note because we are out of time that um, you're right. You yeah. can't numb up that tooth um, yeah, because it'll be sensitive. But the caveat on that is if they've ever been married, then they're already used to pain and suffering, and it's no big deal. You just can't do it on this single person. Hey, Jay, it has been amazing. Tell them your website they can go to to learn all the surgery. Oh, I love it's your uh, website. It's called onlineoralsurgery.com. And, and how many hours of surgery do you have hours on there? About 13 hours of content. Uh, the last uh, five hours or, or pretty close to that are in high definition. Uh, we're adding new content all the time. It's on everything about basic office oral surgery, IND, infections, surgical extractions, root retrieval, management of bleeding, management of infections, impactions, uh, biopsy, you name it, whatever will increase your competence and confidence in office-based oral surgery, it's on the website and it's growing uh, all the time. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, there's nothing cooler then sitting in your lazy boy, watching that on the big screen, listening to Jay on surround sound, and you feel like you're literally sitting yeah. on the person's incisor watching the whole thing. I mean, it is world class, unbelievable. And a lot of dentists are thinking, oh, I can't watch that in my front room. You know, my family would kill they me. Love are it. you kidding me? Yeah. Two my year old, love it. they love it. I, I watched that with my two year old granddaughter, and she was mesmerized. And I mean, it is just, it's just amazing. Jay, I want to thank you not only for all that you do for your patients and all that you do for dentistry, but you are just, I, I can't think of a more important person well, thanks, on Dental Town. And on behalf of 180,000 townies, thank you for all that you do for Dental Town. And if you, ever want to do this again if you ever want to come back for another hour you got it. my god thank you for another, everything you've another. done for dentistry it's it's just uh, amazing you are a a, a towering figure in, in dentistry everybody knows who you are all over the uh, next time you're at the scottsdale center where you're a regular Sounds speaker good. let's do you sushi. got it. Or we'll rider bikes. okay buddy okay. thanks all right. all okay right. thank you bye, -bye.